Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Winka Dubodam. I'm the chair of the Department of Architecture at Weizmann Architecture. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight in amidst such a strange, strange set of days and a challenging week. I want to remind the students that we uh, think of you in this very tough time, although I just said to everyone, I'm only sending out good vibes. This is all going to be fine, hopefully. Um, and we have also a town hall with the students this Monday, uh, November 9. So whatever happens, I would say to the students, join us all in the town hall and uh, we'll compare notes on what we really think. Um, but despite national uncertainty, I'm glad to have our community join together tonight to welcome a very important Latin American architect from Mexico City, Michelle Rochkind. Michelle was originally scheduled, as you might remember, early April, and due to COVID uh, and the moment, exactly the moment when he was scheduled, we just went through this massive transition to go online. And we really appreciate that he was willing to uh, reschedule with us and to come tonight. Michel Rochkind is the founding principal of Ro Rochkind Architectos and most recently also the senior vice president of architecture at WeWork. Rochkind was born in Mexico City where he studied architecture and urban planning at Iberoamericano University and in 2002 he founded Rochkind Architectos to explore new challenges addressing contemporary society to design compelling experiences go beyond the mere functionality and to connect to intricacies of each project at a much deeper level. According to Forbes Life, he is a representative of a Mexican generation of architects that are transforming the country, not a small thing. Michel is not only a talented architect, he's also a connector, instigator, and amazing collaborator. As you will notice on his website after, you know, of course, after this, you have to go on his website or maybe I've done this already if you're really prepared. I've met Michelle now many years. We just figured out that it was around 2001 in a conference in Caratoro, an absolutely beautiful town in Mexico, uh, just outside of Mexico City. And um, have known him ever since, uh, understood how important it is and learned from Michelle how important it is to collaborate uh, with friends, to work together on architecture projects, but not only that, to, to think of life and architecture as culture in life. And I think that uh, we share very much. And uh, I very much appreciate in the way he works, but also in the way he uh, creates uh, collaborators and friends and teams around himself. His completed projects include the most recent concert hall, Fora Boca, on the Gulf of Mexico, um, also Mexico's National Film Archive and Film Institute, and the Nestle Chocolate Muse Museum in Mexico City. But he has also done housing projects such as High Park and Querero 108. And uh, what I totally enjoyed today was a playlist for Spotify, so you know, you have to dig that one up. Uh, in 2019, Rochkin became the senior vice president of architecture for the WE company, which is the parent company of what we know as WeWork. One of his upcoming projects is the 200,000 square foot building in Bentonville, or Arkansas. Um, Michel is also highly active in academics. He has been a visiting professor at SciArc, at the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia in Barcelona, DIEC. And at the Weizmann School, of course, uh, Michel, maybe three years ago, I think, taught a, um, a 700 studio with us. Uh, in 2010, Rochkind was named as, the, as one of the country's treasured architects by the Mexican Civil Registry. The Los Angeles Times named Michel among the face to watch in 2010, which is also when he got the Architecture League's uh, Emerging Voices Award. In 2011, he was named by Wallpaper Magazine as one of the 150 movers, shakers, and makers. I already told you that. 
uh, that have rocked the world in the last 15 years. So that's a pretty big way of moving, shaking and making. In 2013, Forbes magazine named him one of the most influential architects of contemporary Mexican scene. So with that, I'm super happy to have Michel back at Weizmann. Uh, and I welcome him to uh, let us know what he's up to next. Thank you, Michel. Oh, thank you, Luca. Thanks, everybody that's connected right now. Pleasure to be together in this crazy moment and not only in, in the world in general, but what's happening even today with the elections in the United States and everything, everything, everything. But as Winka say, positive, this is gonna be great. So um, I'm gonna start uh, by sharing my screen. Let me see if it, everything works good, if you're seeing the screen there. Um, and uh, I'm gonna try something out, which we haven't done, which is, uh, I'm gonna try to be sketching while I'm talking about things that you're seeing on the screen and seeing how well uh, we can, we can work this. So uh, be, be, be patient with, uh, with this technology. But uh, thanks for having me, Winka. I love being your friend for such a long time. Uh, as you know, for me, uh, architecture is more about how we're being built while we build things, no? How architecture has that capacity of, of, of transforming us while we're designing these projects and understanding certain situations, no? So, so basically a little bit of the, the talk that I'll, you'll be hearing is uh, this thing about shared responsibility and how do we uh, understand reviving communities through architecture. And um, I, I think it's important that, that to understand uh, with everything that's happening in the world right now, how do we seek solutions and how do we bring something as an added value beyond the architecture? So, uh, Something really important to me is the idea of built on craft and, the, and craftsmanship for the buildings or the, the, the projects that we're we'll designing. But I have to come back always to saying, well, I come from Mexico City. This is a little bit of the window view <laughs> when you're arriving in this gigantic uh, metropolis in Mexico. So Mexico City, where you start uh, by understanding all, all, all the things that are going on, all this chaos that maintains us super creative, and uh, a place that Mexico is this, this crazy place where everybody's ingenious by necessity. There's a sense of, of, sort of, of I mean, you have to be creative to survive in, in this uh, environment. And uh, it happens on the very, every, every day, you know? So I want to start with this image that represents Mexico. So this was taken by Gerardo Salinas, a uh, next partner, a business partner that I had in Mexico. So this guy that you see here, uh, let me, single him out the guy who's there uh, on top of the of the light this guy is the owner of the business on the corner of the coca-cola uh, store that you see there so this guy was calling uh, the municipality because this the traffic light was not working so people were not coming to his store so basically he said well guys if you don't fix this i mean i'm, I'm not getting clients this is crazy cars go so fast that people are scared of crossing the street to go to my store so he called his compadre. His compadre is this guy who's holding the ladder there, who had the truck, and this guy holding, holding the ladder uh, to the guy who's trying to fix the light post, which of course he doesn't have, know anything about electricity, but he's willing to put his hands in there and get electrocuted just to make a, set, make a point of, I don't care if the government's gonna re return my call, I'll do it by myself. So of course, when everything is set there, like, a, like if this was a movie, this guy now comes in, which is a police guy, stands there and says, everything is under control. It's like, <laughs> so this is a little bit how Mexico works, guys. This is, this is kind of a, I love this image because it really represents this. Um, we don't have a system that we're waiting for the system to give us solutions. We improvise and we're working in that way in every single thing. And I think that's, uh, it, it, this relates to the work that we're doing. And this is one of the first houses that I did once I separated from a, my, a partnership that I had with Isaac Broida and Miquel Adria. And uh, I was fortunate enough also to have Winka come with me to this house. This is a house for a ballerina dancer done in 2001. So it's almost, uh, almost 20 years old, this project. But uh, I remember the idea that we wanted, I wanted something to be a house that didn't have any, any architectural seams. It didn't have like any ridges or any, any uh, uh, separation on, on, on on the material that it would have. So we, we thought, I need to have something that's 
uh, that might not even come from the construction industry at the time. So we said, well, what happens if we look in a different place? In the same way as the guy who uh, went up the ladder with his friends to fix the light, uh, we went to Colonia Doctores, where they work in uh, car repairs in Mexico City. This is a place where it's incredible because you can, uh, if you're using it, when I was a teenager, I would borrow my, my father's car and if it was scratched because I didn't know how to drive very well, <laughs> he would take it there. They would fix the scratches while you were having some tacos and by the time you would have it home, nobody would recognize that something happened. So I remember these guys that are really, truly magician, you know, at what they do. And I said, what happens if we bring one of these guys to do the house, you know? So this, this was a really interesting moment of understanding how I can bring somebody from a different profession to work on something that we wanted to achieve. So this was how, how we did the, the ballerina house. Uh, another project that I wanna show is uh, Nestle Chocolate Museum. And the relevance of this project where you see the craft, it, it's always there, you know? Uh, the way that we can work with our Mexican teams is, is really incredible. And not only in Mexico, but every time I always talk about digital design and local fabrication and understanding that where you're gonna do something, it's, it's very important that you understand what's the craft there? What, what, are, what are the trades that you can learn from in order to really collaborate with the people that are, that are there? But uh, in this case, at the Nestle Chocolate Museum, we were doing everything on site. We didn't have too much time. This is a project that I think we were giving two, we were given two months and a half to design and build a project. So we were doing everything almost, I mean, uh, part of it we were doing at the studio, but the other part of you see this image here, you would see the facade here lying on the floor. It was being welded on the floor and then lifted it to put on the, on the front of the building. So um, we were working super hard to understand how to make this happen. But I think that the most beautiful, interesting part of the project was a sort of parallel innovation where not only were we designing and building there and figuring things out, but the client never asked for a chocolate museum. And I kind of reflect now back on time that because we were questioning the program at, at such a young age, this was 2004 maybe, I remember, or 2003, and uh, we were questioning the program. So the client never asked for a chocolate museum. We literally came back to the office and we started figuring out, uh, they wanted us to just do an intervention on the factory where kids could visit the, the factory of the production of chocolate. And then we said, well, why don't we make Nestle give back to the community? Why don't we have a company like them just give something in return where they can brand, of course, their company, but they can teach the rest of the, the community about the history of chocolate in Mexico, which to us made total sense. So they agreed on the idea and that's how we got the commission for the Chocolate Museum. And uh, this of course laid a foundation that, was very, that has been very important in, in my career after that, because every time we get a program by the client, we sit down and question the program with him to understand what could be added to the program not only from the architectural point of view, but also from, uh, we bring in specialists, sociologists, anthropologists, economists, landscape designers, anybody that needs to sit at the table, which you'll see in some other projects. This is also a, little, a, a small project that we did back in the days that talks a lot about collaboration, but also about what we want to fabricate and design and build, uh, thinking about what we have in terms of budget and in and, and, and our reach, no? What's the capability of the, of the workers and the craft again? So I remember when we were working Tori Tori, which uh, I was fortunate enough also to invite as a collaboration, the guys from Cocuya, which Winka, you know very well also, and they, they, they teach, and not only they teach there, you also have Rob, who's also, <laughs> who now is, is a super amazing um, uh, talent that's pushing the boundaries of, of, of uh, fabrication. No? So, uh, they helped us out with this project where we wanted to do something very interesting for a restaurant. And uh, we had very little budget. So if you see here the really thin gauge of the material that was then welded together in these box shaped elements. And then we sprayed recycled plastic foam on the inside that they would expand. So then when you would grab the pieces, they wouldn't sound like hollow pieces. But I just love the idea. And this is to me what, I mean, I always wish that architecture was more about showing the process where you can smell the welding and see everything that comes together to make these pieces. Because uh, to me, it's a very beautiful story. And it, it tells a story about these amazing people that are these craft guys that do an amazing work. No? So um, having these images and seeing them work and getting them involved to us was, was amazing. This is the final result. In terms of collaboration, this is a project with a dear friend of mine, Hector Esraue, who's a very 
very, very uh, talented Mexican industrial designer uh, where we collaborate a lot. So this was Nacho Cadena, also a branding specialist and graphic designer. Um, here you can see, uh, it's very nice, the details here, because the windows on the inside open completely. So when, when the windows are closing up, you have the mullions of the window appearing, but then as you pull them back uh, uh, into the walls, they kind of disappear into the, um, into the um, walls and, and create an open space with this Brie de Soleil. Uh, so Toritori, a restaurant that of course uh, has been very successful and we've managed to do a couple of other projects. And um, I think it's important as, as the same guy that I was showing that had this, the, his store that nobody was buying, that we cannot wait uh, for governments and, and city planning to decide many of the things. I think that as creatives, as, as, um, as, as so, I mean, as, as a community with concerns, we have to design for these other things that might not even be happening. So uh, when we got called upon to do the National Film Institute, uh, La Cineteca Nacional, um, it was very interesting because it, the, the program was very clear. They wanted us to do uh, four new cinemas. They wanted to do, us to do more uh, vaults uh, for, the, uh, for the archive. But we, we went back and we said, well, what's the original identity of the Cineteca? So here in the image, uh, I'm gonna, uh, what, you would what, what you would do if you arrive there, you would walk uh, into this space and then just come inside. And this would be the whole experience of Cineteca. The rest was a parking lot. So what we said, well, let's, let's first understand what we have. And it was beautiful to understand the, the size of the property. So when you have uh, the size of the property and understand how the whole complex can behave, then to us, it was very, very important to go back and say, well, first thing, let's take the cars out. So the first thing that we wanted to do is propose a parking lot at the entrance of the building. So you would leave the cars at the entrance and then come in in a sort of campus-like experience uh, with the buildings now um, uh, sprawled on the sides, connecting the existing buildings to, to new buildings and then creating a, 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 a cover that which you'll see uh, in the next images. So this cover or this, this, this rooftop that connects the new cinemas to the old cinemas, there you have the parking garage in the back. So again, this experience about leaving the car, but then coming forward in, uh, into the space and walking around it like a, a campus-like experience. Um, the, the, as, as I mentioned, these four new cinemas, of course, acoustic and, 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 um, and isoptics were, were top priorities. Again, this is a project where uh, Hector Esraue worked uh, with us on the project, along with uh, Alberto Villarreal, who used to be my partner back in the days in a company we have for industrial design or product design called Agent. Uh, fortunately, Alberto was picked up by Google, and now he works on product design by Google doing their cell phones and computers, which I'm, I'm super proud of, but this is a, was a beautiful collaboration. Uh, this is a project that was done in a, um, uh, our president Calderon's term. So it was the last, uh, we had nine months to deliver a, a final cultural project during his term. So it was like a crazy moment of understanding how we could deal with doing 60, 100,000 square feet of a project uh, in nine months before he left term. So this was a, the image of, of, of the existing uh, project. And as you see, all this asphalt with the parking lot and, 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 and the garage there, which of course we wanted to, to uh, take away immediately to, and convert it into something that's more beautiful that now you have the gardens, you have the, now this uh, images of uh, uh, people that just go there and just hang out or have a coffee, which, which I love seeing because it's not only now about going to the films and enjoying the films, it's about having uh, this garden space as an oasis in the middle of all this real estate construction that's going on in, uh, in the Cineteca, well, around the Cineteca in Coyoacán. Uh, nice to see kind of the sequences where you're going up the ramps to the four new cinemas that you have on your right side, but you're peeking through these windows, seeing the existing building. And of course, we questioned the program as we questioned the program for, for uh, Nestle. And here, uh, we questioned the idea of being outside. And we said, what happens if we propose an outdoor cinema? Because Mexico has this amazing climate that would be beautiful to just sit out and chill, no? And at the beginning, there was a little bit of a resent. Uh, they, they, they said, no, maybe this is not such a good idea. Fortunately, they agreed, so we, we carried on. And, uh, and again, the idea of having positive impact on the community and serving uh, as a platform, not only for watching films. So this space now, it has concerts and it has theater and has many other performing arts happening uh, while there. 
Uh, for instance, these are man, uh, uh, protests that happen within the, 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 the Cineteca. Here are some of the fathers of the disappeared uh, students that were they're still were still complaining to the government where where are they or for instance when when things uh, happen like the earthquake that this is a gathering space for people to bring uh, uh, help food and and anything that's required so it became this incredible space for everything no an open space a democratic space for people to just be there or ask or or propose or 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 perform or or just the everyday life. So here in the images that you're seeing, uh, there's there's this guy that you see on your right hand side playing guitar uh, or somebody bringing out their computer, but they are enjoying a space. And this is what I mean, designing for other things to happen. Not only designing what's on the program, but designing to have these kind of excuses where life happens, no? So again, this is a theater performance that we had in the middle of the space at the Cineteca. Uh, or if you see this image that it's interesting to, to when we propose a space, of course, the people from the Cineteca said, well, it's great, but we need something else because people might not sit on the garden. And Paola, who used to be the director uh, back then, Paola Storga, she said, let's do these petates. P petates are these wooden tapestries that like, like they, they look like these blankets, but they're beautiful made of this with the uh, palm. So people would sit down there and enjoy the space. So, it's funny because you would listen to people saying, or the guy giving them away, they would say, he would ask like one or two petates. So it was interesting because I didn't know that they would, they would ask one or two. So one is a couple that were gonna put the petate on the ground and watch the film. If they were asking for two, that means they were not gonna watch the film. They didn't care what the film was playing. They would just make out under the second petate, no? So if you see here, there's a couple that doesn't mind having one, they're just there. <laughs> kissing each other, which I think is great. Or this other creative couple on your left-hand corner that are, they did like a taco with one, <laughs> with one petate, no? So, uh, I mean, you can get creative, just be careful if you're invited to the Cineteca and somebody is asking for two petates because you're not gonna watch the movie for sure. But anyway, uh, this is the day of the opening. It's interesting because the government was not very responsive to see how it was gonna, uh, it was if it was going to be successful or not. We planned it for 600 people, and the day of the opening, there were 2,000 people. Uh, so it was beautiful to see even the community in the back. Here, the back room where you see the lights, th these are the gates that connect uh, uh, El Pueblo de Joco, the Joco town. And then the trees here in the back, these are the, the, the trees from the cemetery of, of, the, of the Joco town as well. So even the relationship of... Um, the people watching the movie, the street and people standing on the gate and then the lights that were giving lights to the uh, trees on the, on the um, um, cemetery were beautiful to watch. And so from, from that day on, it's been very successful. And um, one of the things that I personally believe that uh, in the beauty of craft is again, with this life of, of, of speed and, and we need velocity and everyone, everybody's rushing. And I think that even now with the pandemic, it's been one of the positive aspects has been the slowdown and the, and the questioning of how we're doing the things we're doing. So I think the slowdown and the craft becomes very, very important. And we'll talk about a little bit of the pandemic a little bit later, but uh, here making the, 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 the connection of the craft, slowing things down, but also the importance of the human connection. All the, uh, what I was saying about watching, witnessing the process of uh, what we're doing, uh, almost like if you could feel uh, everything that's going on and the connection of the, of the people welding. This is a second project that we designed for a, a department store company. And uh, in Rojkin Arquitectos, we don't believe in, in, in bad projects. We believe in projects that are able to push forward thinking ideas. And here, I don't remember when was the time when, when all these department stores started to be uh, storage spaces where they would close and shut down towards the street. So we said, why don't we come back to opening up and not only people on the inside looking out, but what happens if on the outside, you're also looking towards the inside. So becoming part of what's going on in, the, in our environment was really important. So we started designing all these experiences that could happen in a facade that you would inhabit the facade, not only with, with, with mannequins and putting like Mother's Day a sale, which of course we were not interested in, 
we were interested in experiences. So what would happen if I had like a coffee place? So, so I would be sitting down in this place, but maybe take some stair, uh, take the stairs down and then connect and maybe come back again. So, so this whole experience of a couple of hexagons that are that were here creating something that was was uh, uh, making it feel alive. No, um, we presented it in, a, in this uh, animation, and again, this is some of the tools that we use at the office to bring the experience closer to the clients. So it's not about just using the 3D environments for us, but it's about showing the client a little bit of the intention of this thing, like opening up like flower buds, but, but with life of the experience happening on the inside uh, as a metaphor. So, so not only the space uh, to be seen and, and, and to see from, but what would happen if we start uh, creating experiences i mentioned like a either radio station that would appear in one of the corners or or this gastronomical experience but but something that relates to your everyday life and can enhance the experience for the for the people on the outside of the, of the space or the store or people on the inside no? it was interesting to think also what would happen if you have a, a working area also on the inside where you can invite people to have meetings there and all that because they're connected to their gastronomical area and they're drinking coffee and then they would just come in and buy more stuff at, at, at the store so uh, so this project uh, um, it's a second project that we did for this company and uh, and again it was beautiful because uh, to even witness when they did the contracts to hire the the, 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 the contractors one of the companies that won, uh, I remember uh, when they told me which was the company, I said, well, I'd love to go and watch uh, their, their factory because I want to see if they understand the project or if they need something. And we get really involved in, in those decisions because uh, we always want everybody that's involved in any of our projects to really understand what the project is about. So I remember walking in and I asked the guy, uh, can you tell me where your CNC machine is? Because I'd love to see how you're cutting the hexagons. So he points to the back of the... <laughs> of the, of the, of the factory and he points at this guy Luis and is like Luis say hi so he was a, the CNC uh, <laughs> machine that was cutting all the hexagons by hand which was amazing because the precision of this guy um, was was amazing and, and the, they, they were super proud of not only cutting them but welding them putting them together going over each of the details to make them uh, be exactly the same and that's what I I, I love about uh, uh, I mean, working in Mexico, that you have uh, these magicians that I call and, and amazing artists that are working on on things like this, even the three meter high hexagons. So again, putting putting everything together. So um, not only getting stuff ready for the mockups, but also even the, uh, being on site and watching this thing come uh, together uh, piece by piece was very interesting because uh, people, the construction companies were using the staircases on the outside to go from one level to the other. So it was interesting to see how even the experience of building it made sense for everything that was happening on the outside. And you would normally have maybe a blind facade with graphics, no? Um, some of the construction photographs. And then the final result of the, of the project uh, with the opening towards the street. And again, here you have a, the things that I was talking about. So you have spaces like, like this one where uh, you just have a little bit of a, some staircases coming down and then you're just poking out to the view on the outside of the street. So, so it's very interesting. Uh, the company at the end didn't uh, fully uh, take advantage of these spaces. They're still there, but they're not activated as we thought they could have activated them. It's still okay, but, but I think that's when we decided not to work with the company anymore because I mean, we're not interested in just building the project. We're interested in building the projects, but, but having the continuity of the experience as a connector to the community and seeing what it could start uh, giving or bringing back to, 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 to the, the, the existing community nearby. Um, again, some of the images and how it lights up at night. Fortunately, they don't have the, the sale signs on the, on the outside, which, which uh, at least they, they committed to leaving it like super clean. Um, I'm going to jump down to Photovoca, which Winka was mentioning, and this was a beautiful opportunity for me because uh, coming from a musical background, but also then doing art, the architecture was was kind of the, the mix of my both careers. No, so uh, Photovoca 
Um, again, this whole idea of focusing on the challenges that make us understand how we can deliver growth and value into the lives of others and the lives of uh, people in general, giving back to the community. This is a project that I have to say that at the beginning, I was a bit skeptical on working with the government again, because this whole idea of doing a, a, a 600,000 square foot project as a National Film Institute in nine months was crazy. And I didn't want to have this uh, idea of uh, rushing again and with, with super low budget or, or, or not a great budget and, and all the restrictions necessary. But once I heard the story, I, I couldn't say no at all. No. So basically what happened here is that Miguel Angel Yunes, the, the mayor of Boca del Rio, eh, once he was mayor of Boca del Rio, he started asking the people there in Boca del Rio what they were proud of, what made them proud of Boca del Rio. And it was sad to hear that the response was they didn't know what to respond. So they would say Veracruz or the port of Veracruz. And he said, no, 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 Veracruz is there. That's the port. But what in Boca del Rio here, what are you proud of? So he invited uh, Manuel Mestre, the, the, the music director, to come and to start seeing how many musicians we had there and started putting together a philharmonica uh, so people would start being proud of playing in a philharmonica that started growing so fast that they really became popular. And now they were playing in many uh, of the venues around the, all the country. And uh, by the time they called us, they needed a venue. So they needed a house for the philharmonica. So, uh, of course, as an architect and being a musician, I said, wow, this is a beautiful uh, project to work on. The second thing that we were super fortunate enough was to make the decision of where to put the project. So at the beginning, there were conversations of putting it in different locations. And the, 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 the last location where we, where we all agreed that it was the best place was this one, where uh, it's where the river goes down to the sea, you know? So that's why it's called Boca del Rio, the river, uh, the, the mouth of the river. And we have a one kilometer strip here, which is called Boulevard Vicente Fox. And uh, the best place to put the project was exactly, exactly here. Uh, a complicated area because here we have all the north winds coming super strong. You have all the uh, uh, hurricane season. So it's, it's a place where all, this, uh, all these properties here were not fully developed because most of the time they were all full of sand and people didn't want to develop too much. So we said, this is going to be the best place to put the, the, the concert hall because then definitely this will become a, a place where people are now are going to rethink about how it's going to de further develop in terms of the urban planning. Another very important condition was that we always included the wave breaker as part of the project with the project. We said, we want the project, the house of the Philharmonica to extend its floor to the outside and be generous enough to give back to the community. So if you're a fisherman and you're fishing uh, here at the, at the Wave Breaker, you feel that the, this Philharmonica gave something back to the fishermen and gave some back to, to anybody that was just walking around. Because when we got there, of course, the Wave Breaker was full of broken beer bottles and diapers and needles, and it was a mess. So um, it was very important for us that no matter where we talked about the project and where we presented, we always included the Wave Breaker. We always included the back parts where we wanted to create these plazas for, for everybody that was around the area. So it's not only about the, the house for the Philharmonica, but even making sure that the Philharmonica, uh, everybody there also knew that they were gonna have a project that was opening up towards the community. Uh, here you see the physical model and the whole idea behind these uh, concrete blocks was again, thinking about the wave breakers and, and how you go from the scale of a wave breaker that you're now trying to connect to the city and, the, and these boxes start becoming a bit bigger and how we could compose or break a little bit the size of the Philharmonic into many different boxes that included a recording studio, the back of house, another uh, performance area and a terrace space to complete all these uh, different boxes. So um, we started the construction of the project, which was, of course, uh, understanding all the right elements and conditions to build uh, that close to the water uh, with special foundation. And here you see a little bit of, of what you had as a context. No, there's a little house there, or there's a little garden that you see here that's not occupied by anybody or an abandoned lot uh, on the side. So um, understanding these conditions that to us were really important to uh, for this project to, to help the city grow in a, in a better way um, in that area. So here you see a section of the, uh, of the hall. The hall has a capacity for 980 people on the, on the inside of the space. You have a little mezzanine 
that works very nicely to, uh, uh, to uh, as the view to, from, from the upper part. And that mezzanine connects to the outside to this terrace where the building protects you from, from the north winds and from, from the environment, the harsh environment. But once you're there and you can go out and, and take a, a view from the terrace, you understand the positioning of the building as well. There's some nice interior gardens that you see here in the back. So, so the, the, the back of house and the office spaces that you have are really interesting because you have these patios with gardens uh, looking up to the sky. Um, so these were the, the images that we presented um, during the, the, the presentation for the community. Uh, of course, the craft is always there. Uh, the idea of putting together these these boards that were separated by, by uh, an inch, uh, half an inch. So by doing this relief of, of pushing and pulling and, 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 and moving the, um, the form work, we created this texture on the sides where we, we did some tests uh, on site until we got the right uh, quality that we wanted to. And this is the final image uh, of the construction site. So not only, not only the idea of, of, of the stripes that you would start seeing on the facade in this direction and then creating shadows on others, the other direction, depending on the size of the cubes, but also the floor that is made of, of granite. The granite has the same proportion. It also plays a little bit with the stripes in the other directions that, that we wanted to produce kind of the same effect uh, for the building in, in, in the overall. Um, a nice uh, um, idea for the entrance because it's called Foro Boca, again, the, the, uh, the mouth of the, of the, of the theater. So you would come in through this little squeezed gap there of a cantilever, cantilevering box to create a compressed space. So once you go into the area and, and get your tickets and enter the hall, you have this amazing openness with a triple height once on the inside. And this is one of the most interesting moments that we had there. And this is very important that I'll, I'll, I'll talk a lot about this after I, I put the video. But I remember the, the mayor coming to us and saying, oh, this was four months after the opening. And he said, I want everybody now on the, on the main concert hall. I have some important information. So of course, as things happen in Mexico and working with the government, we thought that this guy was gonna start screaming at everybody, telling us that we were delayed and the construction company was, it was also delayed and how, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, screaming bad things at us. And um, actually this is, this is what happened. One by one, every musician from the Philharmonica started appearing with hard hats and vests to play the first concert for the workers, making sure that they understood that by wearing the hard hats and the vests, they were the same, exactly the same as them as workers doing a project that was gonna be the house for the Philharmonica. So this is something that sometimes we forget as designers and architects, we're always thinking about the future and what good we will do in the future for communities and for, for future things happening, but we forget the day to day. And the day to day is saying hi to the police guy who helped you open up the door from the building that you just walked in, or the guy in the street that you just passed by that you didn't say hi to. This is what we should be thinking about in our everyday actions, no? And this is again, a way of, being very introspective of, are we part of the problem or are we part of the solution? It's not what we're doing, but also how we're doing the things that we're doing. So this was an, an incredibly moving moment because you can imagine the workers, the last four months, they were working in this project so proud and so happy because, because we acknowledged them. We made them feel as they should be, as they should feel, no, important and, uh, and part of course of of this whole project. So when, when we started getting recognitions for the project, eh, I always say that, that I, don't, I, I don't see that as a surprise, and not in an arrogant way as an architect saying like, I'm not surprised we won certain awards. I'm not surprised because all the intentions and the magic of the way we were doing this project and how it, it, it started were there. So the magic was always on a constant flow 
um, uh, with the project. Even, even at the end, which this is sometimes very rare and for most people that don't know the conditions in Mexico, there was a government project that by the time we finished the project, they gave the papers to the patronage uh, that, was, that is running the building. So the government making sure that this, was not, they would, this would not remain a government project because as we know, if this would, this would have remained as, the government, as a government project, they might have shut it down in the next term when another political party had won. That happens in many countries also. So, um, so this is the, the final images, how it looks on the outside. Here's what, I was, what I'm mentioning. If you see, it's gonna be great to see images in the future when all this start getting uh, uh, medium uh, high buildings that again, that serve uh, as, as residential or, or maybe some office spaces, but, but always maintaining the base part of the building in a direct connection with retails and shops and, and, and the little restaurants and quesadillas that we have already there uh, to promote this cultural life happening at the base and connecting to the, to the ocean uh, for sure. Um, some views from the river going to the ocean. Uh, we were very concerned also uh, about even this connection to the to the existing wave breaker that it would not be something straight but something that went a little bit more meandering. Uh, fishermen came back, of course, so now you have light so they can fish at, at any time of the day. The inside of the spaces, a, a little bit like like the film institute, they're designed for many things to happen. So it's not only about uh, the concert on the inside; you could also have uh, performances on the outside or different things uh, uh, happening on the venue. Today, it's used for many different things, DJ concerts, the book fairs they've organized, yoga um, symposiums, and many, many other things. Uh, another beautiful aspect that I have to recognize is that uh, the mayor also uh, uh, said that no matter what happened on the inside, he wanted the outside to be projected and, and the sound for free to everybody around the community. So here is the first concert that Joshua Bell, um, we were privileged enough to have him play with the Philharmonica. And he was playing for, for the community on the outside. So you had people sitting on the outside of the, of the building as well. No matter what is played inside the photo, it, it will always be projected and, and the sound on the outside uh, as long as the photo walk exists for sure. Uh, some images of the inside, uh, a little bit of how we wanted to create a, a very unique mezzanine, making sure that whoever was performing, when they look back at the mezzanine, they would remember because it, would, it had like this little separation uh, uh, on the upper floor to make them recognize it was not a discontinuous uh, 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 mezzanine as in most uh, parts or, or concert halls. Again, you can see it also in the back and, and see the Philharmonica, uh, all these concrete panels, acoustic, uh, acoustic concrete uh, elements on the walls, but uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the wooden panels creating all, all this acoustic effects, helping the, uh, the space with the, with the resonate, uh, resonation. Um, uh, here you see again the, the river, how it uh, flows uh, back to the sea. And again, you will, uh, the, the, the interesting thing also here is that the pavement, the granite, if you see in this image, is already connecting all the way back from the wave breaker. So the whole idea is not only um, that it connected to the uh, uh, Vicente Fox Boulevard, but also extending all the way back, creating uh, an ex a, a, a more extended, uh, complete space for the community. Um, this is a new project that I'll go uh, quick on this one because there's a lot of images, but I wanted to show you this one, which is a new project. This is a winery that's been recently shown in a couple of uh, 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 media outlets. But uh, uh, the, the interesting thing about this project is a little bit how we, we took the, um, the understanding of the, of the land. So uh, the client called us and he had three little uh, hills, one of which was uh, already uh, flattened out at the top because somebody might, uh, we thought that maybe the previous owner uh, uh, had flattened one of these little hills out to do a, a house or something. So uh, we started working on what do you do if you have this beautiful site in terms of the, uh, for the winery. These are some images walking on the site. Again, beautiful collaborations of all these amazing uh, friends and talented people that I have the fortune of uh, not only calling friends, but collaborators. Um, these existing rocks that are, are boulders that are there that create already a, a, an amazing uh, background. So basically what we have is a, a, we have a winery here at the entrance uh, where you can park at the entrance and just go come and visit the, the winery or actually drive, come up to this area here 
and then uh, walk up to the restaurant and, uh, and, and do, you're checking for the villas because it has um, 28 villas around the whole site. And then you have some restaurants and some other areas that you'll see in some of the uh, next images. But a very uh, interesting project that, again, was based on the understanding of the site and the conditions. And the idea that even here that you're seeing most of the villas, they don't seem to appear. And here, for instance, on the, on the first hill, uh, this is a, a part of the reception area and, uh, and part of the, 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 the first uh, intention of the project that we wanted to, to redo the hillside with an existing building that becomes the reception area and the restaurant for the, for the welcoming of the, of the area, of the, of the winery. And again, you have to look like very closely to start seeing that the villas are, re are already there, a little bit mimicking the landscape and um, you'll see them a little bit more how they, how they uh, integrate. Um, so we start with a, with a reception and uh, the whole idea was uh, again: what do we, how do we produce something that's that's built with the actual uh, uh, land or the or the, the sand or the, the materials of the site? So we started playing around with with bricks. What happened if we did some bricks uh, with the local dirt and and with local uh, workers? So we're creating these cupolas that that intersect and create these these nice spaces on the inside uh, with a great courtyard in the middle to receive people so the idea or the mix of of concrete with the same uh, color of the of the earth that we have there and then are bricks made locally with the, with the local earth um, so again we these were some tests with regular brick that we were uh, trying out for the beginning and then of course the do's and don'ts when you're testing stuff out your prototypes and mock-ups uh, the second part were the uh, pool area and uh, we went through different iterations and the whole idea that we enjoyed very much was what would happen if in, uh, playing around with, uh, with the idea of the boulders, but then inverting them. So you have the pools become these uh, bowls that are now reflecting what, what the rocks do from above, but now these do from below. No? So if you're coming up towards the project and you're seeing these concrete uh, shapes of the, of, the, of the pools, they start resembling uh, the boulders that happen on the, on the, on the upper part of the, of the building. So, um, there. So again, these these uh, you have different types of pools, a more uh, com uh, community pool, and then the ones that are up there that are a little bit more private. Uh, how they start integrating, of course, uh, the idea with this is that the landscape starts kind of uh, going inside the project, so, so it starts maybe disappearing a little bit and, and getting the patina of the of uh, the outside environment. So it starts blending a little bit more with what's going in, uh, on with the project uh, itself. No. So again, these images of the, the beautiful, beautiful site in Ensenada. If you haven't been there, please don't, don't forget to visit. Uh, fortunately, there is no airport direct, so you need to go through Tijuana and then uh, enjoy the drive from Tijuana to Ensenada. Um, some day images and night images of the restaurant area. And, um, and then again, these villas that I won't spend too much time, but you have like the double villas that if you're go if you're walking on top of the uh, of the uh, all the the landscaped areas and and and, and uh, you have to you're walking next to them and you're not seeing them because they're 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 covered with the same vegetation but you actually have to come down to access them and then you have your your amazing views to the different sides or uh, if you're coming with a, a different family you can share um, a com uh, ones that are independent or, or ones that are have common spaces for bigger families. Um, but again, the whole idea, instead of having something pop out, these go against the landscape. So it's, what's beautiful about these is that you, you're able to cut a section on the landscape and create these inner courtyards for these, these, uh, these ones to appear. And so uh, many configurations of, of the villas, again, uh, got all uh, within their understanding of privacy and, 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 and bigger houses and smaller houses for for guests to enjoy the, the winery scene in Valle de Guadalupe. And uh, lastly, oh, there you see that the, the, the retaining walls become these planters. Uh, so you actually get to uh, uh, camouflage them a little bit more. Uh, finally, you have the winery, which the winery, this uh, circular element that, that again is on the side of the building, again with the walls, uh, with, with the natural vegetation on the side and, and 
the idea of these arches when you come in and you're um, basically enjoying the, the way of the production of the wine and then you have an, another wine tasting area and then a little bit of the nighttime images as you can uh, see on, on, on the amazing landscape and sunsets and sunrises that you have in Valle de Guadalupe. Um, a small house that we're doing in, uh, in Mexico, because I think it's important that we always talk about not, it's not the scale of the building or not the scale of the project, but I think it's the, the intention of the project or, or uh, what we're learning from them. And here we wanted to do something that uh, uh, the, the, the black element that you see here is a circulation of the, of, the, of the house. So there's this huge element that goes around and connects to every other uh, space within the house. So uh, the compression of, a, of an indoor uh, hall of circulation or mobility diagram that ends up connecting uh, the rest of the spaces. Um, this is under construction as we speak, uh, creating these courtyards and then um, this nice way of entering a house through your own garden, uh, the construction site there. Um, the floor plan, the, what, an interesting thing about this project is that the client asked us, he has two teenagers. So he said, I want the teenagers or my kids to come into the house and have an independent access. So they come through the house and they have an independent access. They also wanted uh, an office space. So if somebody's coming to see one of uh, my, my client's wife, he comes in and he uses this staircase to come up to a little studio that they have on top. Or the regular access is you would come into the house, go underneath the house and, and, and go, walk through the garden and come in to that space, which is where everybody would normally come in. So if you see the upper floor plans, here you see the, the studio that, that works for my client or the houses for both of the teenagers or the, the I mean, the, the bedrooms that of course connect to the house, but they have their privacy and then their, their independence, or they can still connect again to this uh, black concrete uh, mobility diagram and connect down to the, to the kitchen and have a little bit of the, the same experience. So privacy, but still connected. Uh, some of the physical models uh, that we do for the house. Of course, this whole circulation element uh, has these uh, perforations to pr provide these nice light uh, coming down uh, for the house. Um, uh, again, the idea of what we could do for the formwork and uh, we decided to have this zigzag element to create this black concrete for the circulation. And uh, here you see some of the pouring and how it's uh, coming together. Um, and then, and yeah, this will be finished in a couple of months and I'll, I'll sure have some additional images to show. But again, it's important, the idea of no matter how big or small the project, the idea of the craft and the detailing and the, and, uh, the understanding of the experience and no matter how uh, complex the relationship of the family is in terms of if they want more independence or less independence or their own way of having a small office, which now with the pandemic made it a very um, uh, or a stronger project for them because now they can have uh, their, their workspace within their home. No? And um, I'm gonna show a, a, a last project and then we can open it up, open it up for, for Q&A. Uh, and I think what, um, this is a project called Morning Claim. I don't know if, if some of you saw it or not, but again, this is a project that to me is very relevant because Nobody asked us to do this. And I think that with the pandemic and everything going on right now, eh, we, go in, we, we start getting in touch more with our human part rather than anything else, no? So eh, at least for me, the whole idea of having enough, eh, being privileged enough to have a house where you can quarantine or where you can stay and you can eh, eh, take care of yourself, understanding that privilege in a way, how can I help other people? So um, eh, questioning, uh, what can I do better as a human and understanding how we need to react. So, so this, this, this is a project that we propose to do in Times Square, which is uh, the way to honor um, uh, all these people that have died and are still dying uh, due to COVID-19 and, uh, and making sure that uh, the ones that were still here, we understand that all this that's going on has to be for something better that we have to keep on fighting for something that is, that, that is worth the fight understanding that we can really uh, 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 be better. No? So again, I always question the ideas, uh, are we, the things that we're working on, are, are that part of, is that part of the problem that got us here or we're, we're being part of the solution in a sort of way? 
So I'm going to read a little text that was written by Arturo um, while I show you this, this video. We question the notion of hospitality and the possibility of welcoming others without an imposed representation of the world, without a narrative setting a reality around an individual understanding of things. We should stop idealizing others in our terms. We worry about the way the pandemic disease could bring societies under state power and systemic surveillance, a situation in which humans can be seen as objects to be managed, but sovereignty over our bodies is just as liberal illusion. We think that the ethical problem with a biopolitical view is that life cannot be managed. We speculate on how we should welcome others in this pandemic crisis, how to create hospitality, how we see things beyond the management. Our intuition leads us to demand the right to bury the dead, which we understand as the key against biopolitical confinement. A grave is the last testimony of life, of our life, Design and architecture can be in charge of materializing the signs that took life by surprise and killed hundreds of thousands without allowing a space for mourning. We are claiming the act of mourning. We can at least take care of that, of building symbols, or we can place a testimony of our lives and the lives of others. Imagine a way through which we can bring these terrible deaths to a shared memory, honoring the lives through cities filled with cenotaphs. It's not about creating memorials uh, or monuments that, uh, that the state can appropriate to manage social sensibilities. It is about creating simple cenotaphs that allow the living to watch over our dead and extend the cemetery inside the city next to our homes. We strive to create a sensibility about death, displaying a social necessity to assume responsibility over the death of another, any other, who died in any country without regards to origin, race, gender, religion, political views, or migratory status. We conceptualize ephemeral installations in Times Square in New York, in Mexico City's uh, Socalo, as a couple of examples, and they consist of placing these locations, a cenotaph dedicated to all who have died with their names. After some, uh, after some weeks of social mourning, We encourage families and friends to participate to take the corresponding cenotaphs to the sidewalks of their homes, and the mourning extends to the neighborhoods of each city. We share our pain and the pain of the others. So the videos you're seeing now is when they can take some of these wooden elements with the names as we see the white bikes in the cities as a way of understanding that they're not just names. It's very sad to see is going on in the world where people cannot bury their dead. So again, it's not that somebody asked us to do this, but it's the idea of getting involved in something that we need to participate. We need to have a say on things, which again, that's why we started doing creative things in the first place, because we wanted to improve things. So uh, with this project, um, I think I opened it up to q and I can leave this. Uh, this is the Mexican Socalo. So again, a project that can be transported anywhere, any country that could share um, uh, an idea to, to have not only the names of people, but really uh, make us understand that unless we have empathy for the other, which doesn't have to be in our immediate circle, things are not going to change. Thank you very much. And I think we can open it to Q&A. <laughs> And Thank I you, Winka. To say something. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> that was very yeah. impressive. I, I, well, your last project is very, very beautiful. But also, I was super touched by the the um, orchestra playing for the workers, which is uh, such a simple idea, and it's so basic. Um, I have often said that. Whatever I always found on my trips in Latin America have humbled me, and I have the same feeling now. Um, the humanity and the care and the understanding of taking care of each other and thinking that that's still normal is huge in Mexico. And it's because of that, it's one of my favorite cities, but also in Bogota and Medellin and um, Colombia. 
what I've seen there is like incredible where neighborhoods go together with universities and mayors and like you do these projects, like you're explaining it to us. It's a beautiful architecture, but I, I want to point out to everyone that these projects are done in collaborations for very little money uh, where you become, you know, I called you already an instigator and generator of uh, new possibilities because, you know, you are making big projects, but you're not necessarily working in a very easy way or in a very profitable way. And, uh, and I think, you know, that's why I am always super inspired to look at what you all as teams are doing um, and also how you collaborate. You know, at some point you said with the restaurant, this person did the branding, that person did the, the furniture, you did the architecture. Kukuja with uh, Roland and Rob did, uh, I think, the facade design. And, you know, and I think this is how we all need to think much more. You know, I think you, that's why I say I, yeah, I learned from you looking at what you do, because I think um, the collaborative aspect it also gives the project a human intensity and, and love for things that sometimes we miss, you know, the the care and the love for things that you can just see from the objects you're creating. And I think, um, yeah, and I know also from you that uh, collaborations are not easy and that, you know, it also creates probably as many problems as it as uh, gives solutions. And I think that is, that is what is very beautiful about it as well. It's life, right? It's life in all its positive and negative aspects. And, and I think that, I mean, it's important that you, you're touching on that, Winka, because there's a lot of people that that want to collaborate but don't know even what a collaboration is, no? Because if a collaboration becomes an imposition on my side to you to do something, then it's not a collaboration. And, and a little bit, we, we in, in, in the creative disciplines, we get confused sometimes with that. And I, I don't know if it has to do with my musical background that I was a drummer for so many years with my band, that when you're a musician, musicians play with each other. And that's that's the whole thing. And if you hear a guitar player that's an amazing guitar player, you raise your hand and you're like, man, let's 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 get together next week and let's jam because you just want to play. You're yeah. not thinking of doing a record or you're not thinking of selling anything. You're just thinking of the beauty of getting together with somebody to create something. So when I left music for architecture, I thought that was going to be the same thing in architecture. And I was hit like with a bat on the face as a surprise of, Wow, these guys don't collaborate at all, though. And and I mean, now there's it's beautiful to see younger generations. They're super collaborative. But back in the days, they, nobody wanted to collaborate a lot because yeah. nobody wanted you to steal their ideas. So it became more of a of a kind of an ego experimentation thing. Which which uh, I think I was super happy to see this solve over time with 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 younger generations and and Mexican colleagues getting together, working on projects. And, and then to the point where I think the beauty was, it was not me doing the architecture and then it's Rawe doing the furniture design or the Nacho doing the branding. It was all of us collaborating on the idea of a thing or a project or a concept or pushing the, or challenging the program and then dividing the work. But mm -hmm. once everybody was invested on the idea and blurring the boundaries of uh, if Rob and Roland did the facade or they, or we all kind of worked on something and they influenced Hector to do the furniture in a certain way was the beauty of, of collaborating, no? And, yeah. and, and you know you've done something right in a collaboration if there's growth. And to mm -hmm. me, that's a really important uh, aspect to mention as in our daily relationships in life. And we, uh, the beautiful relationship that you and me, Winka, have is because we, we, most of the time we talk more about life than anything else, no? So, so again, if there's growth because I learned something from you, that is a collaboration. Yeah. If I didn't learn anything because I was so deaf and I didn't want to hear anything else, just my, my ego driving it, it, it's not a collaboration. It will never be a collaboration. No? Exactly. We have a question from Paul McCoy, who is actually a Mexican-American, right, Paul? Paul? Yeah. Paul! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Paul says, thanks for, en for an energizing lecture on the flip side of the benefits and opportunities, these opportunities that come with a revolving door of multidisciplinary collaborators. What has been the biggest challenge of this method of thinking and making with others? 
How do you keep a resilient attitude when things don't go as planned? I think um, we just answered it. But there's probably in another answer. Yeah, Paul, first of all, hi, man. Uh, great to hear the review. Uh, I think that, I mean, I started at the beginning doing, uh, doing it on my own. I, nobody paid at the beginning that I had a, a landscape designer or a sociologist, but I would be curious to see what they would think. So what I would do if I had a project was inviting, inviting a friend of mine and I, I would tell him, eh, please join me, I'll invite you for lunch or for dinner and we'll go for drinks. And I would want to understand the opinion of a sociologist or a, a, or a landscape designer or even an economist sometimes of what they would think about the project. So I understood very early that coming back to the client, not with the ego of the architect, but rather than with a set of ideas from other people that they were not even interested in anything of the building was really good for the client to kind of lower his guard, no? Like not to feel a question, no? But rather to feel uh, that we were giving him more than just an architectural project. That started, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, I had to pay for it or invite my friends for drinks, which of course they didn't complain at all. But then over time, then I, I started getting clients saying, I want, I want that team. I want, to, I want to do a preface of the project where we have this kind of envisioning session where we can create the best solution for the project. So um, we, it was really interesting because I started uh, seeing clients that were very, very open now to, to hearing things that we were doing. So. Uh, now we have more clients coming to us asking us, well, uh, rather than do this, I have this problem and I think I want to do this. Do you think it's the right thing? And, the, and we work with them and that's why we become, I always say that you're the best position that you can be with a client is become an advisor rather than just a designer. Yeah. If I'm a designer, in two seconds, they can get me out and hire somebody else. Once they know that I'm invested for the best results of their investment in terms of money and time they're not going to let me go that easy because they're going to want to have me for the the continuation of the project and that, that's why we get um, a two or three projects with the same companies and they come back to us because they like that we can advise them uh, not from the ego side again from the architectures doing an object or a thing for them but from a more human aspect where they also felt that they grew in the process and they feel that their projects can give back to, to the community. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a beautiful, actually a beautiful way of going for it. We have another uh, Mexican person, Ivan Armenta from Sonora, mm -hmm. Mexico. 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 Congratulations for your presentation. One question, what advice can you give us to architects from Latin America to gain the client's trust and build a project under our vision, like your vision? Saludos. Uh, Ivan, thanks for the question. Uh, I think that, again, when, when you're, I don't know, but I, I don't know if it happens to you, but at least for me, when something is driven by ego or the wrong reasons, I can smell it three miles away. So I think that clients are the same way. They can smell when you're just pushing your ego because you want to do something that doesn't even, I don't know, have a, have a huge um, uh, idea behind it. And it's just like your, your ego. So as long as you know you're doing the right thing, you should be you should be right i mean you, you, you i mean follow just question what it's doing the thing that you're designing i think a good a good qualifier is what is it doing besides fulfilling the the ask of a client in his wallet or his economy or besides just complying to what your uh, your wants as an architect is it doing something else can it do something else that it will make you feel better because it I have to, there was a beautiful quote by a, a guy that I listened to and, and I, it kept on ringing in my mind. And they were asking him, and actually this, this guy is Sean King, an activist that lives in New York. I, 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 if you haven't heard of him, uh, Google him and, and follow him on Instagram. But, but they were asking Sean uh, at some point, uh, uh, how do you know you're doing your thing? And he answered in a very beautiful way. He said, if you wanna know if you're doing your thing or not, close your eyes and think of what breaks your heart. Now that you know what breaks your heart, now think of what you love to do. So if what you love to do fixes what breaks your heart, you're doing your thing. And I think that's a very beautiful way of, of measuring 
what we're doing, does it have the capacity to fix something that we feel sad about or upset about or, or can help us guide other generations in the right direction? So if it's, if it's yes, you're on the right path. Go for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no? Yeah, and breaking your heart can be also really from beauty, no? Like when you, you gave me the shivers when these people started playing for their local workers. You know, yeah. that, was, that was just so beautiful. And I think uh, we need so much more of this. And I think what you're saying, you know, like don't become the one that becomes part of the problem, but become part of the solution. I think for all of us, it's really going to be super important. We have gone through an amazing summer of so many realizations. And I think this, we should put all that together and really treat that with love and respect for everyone and be as inclusive and have as much empathy as we need um, to have and, in order to kind of move forward. And, and don't be afraid to have an opinion and speak yeah. your voice because again, I mean, unless we start speaking more and, 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 raise, and raising our voice for the right things or for, for, for equality and justice and the things that we want to see changes, nothing else is gonna happen. And, and again, I, the, the video of the, of the orchestra playing for the workers, it, every time a client of mine comes to me and tells me, oh, we're gonna build this community that's gonna do so good for the, the environment. And, blah, and, I, and I, I ask them, and what are you doing now? Tell me a little bit about your life now. Or I watch them how they talk to a waiter, or I watch them how they, they talk to anybody around. And if he's an asshole, and so excuse my French, I don't trust this guy because how, do, how does he think he's gonna do something good in the future when he, he's not a good person? And we have to raise our voices for that and, and, and speak up and say, you should really, I mean, how do they say in English? Put your money where your mouth is, no? I mean, speak what you really are able to deliver, but start from now and, and the idea of it, it, we've had enough time to reflect uh, amongst uh, what we do in the pandemic Winka and by saying a part of the problem or part of the solution I just I, I put an example the other day to my daughter because she wasn't clear about what I was saying and I said okay Nina there could be a guy working on the bottle caps no so they're designing a bottle cap that's beautiful and the design is amazing you have an industrial designer who's doing the most amazing bottle cap but he doesn't care if the bottle has cyanide or if it has water. So mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know, go a step back and understand what you're doing it for and understand that it does matter. So the things that we're doing, how do they connect to the bigger picture and understand that if you're gonna spend time on design and energy on the design, let's really make sure that we're working to forward think and, and for the yeah. future what we want, no? And not designing based on fear and now, Everything is the boy in the plastic bubble. And, and I mean, again, we have to, we, we can't afford to lose our freedom and to, no. and to lose all the beautiful things that we have as human beings that we're becoming responsible for, for uh, letting them go, no? Yeah. Sorry, we have more questions from Mexico. Uh, Octavio. Uh, how to get more involved with the way our projects interact with society and pushes forward communities uh, and which questions to follow now on as a third semester student. Thanks, Michelle, Octavio, Preciado. Octavio. Well, again, it's, it's what I, I mean, when I, when I put this project there uh, to show you guys the memorial, uh, it, it's just, I mean, again, what, what, what pisses you off? What, what really makes you sad? What makes you want to change things? So when I was seeing how many and reading how many people were dying in all the different countries and, and even seeing the way people were reacting like, oh, it's not somebody that I know. It's like, you don't have to wait for somebody that you know to die in order for you to create empathy for, and I, and I use the, the, the term the other because there are no other. We're supposed to all be connected in a way that we should care about each other, not only because you're my family. So anything that's happening right now, being a creative human in this world now requires us to think and provide solutions. So, so I mean, the moment the pandemic started uh, in March, I started working with Carla Fernandez, a fashion designer from Mexico doing masks 
because she couldn't keep her staff and we were figuring out a way if I could get somebody to buy more masks to give for free to people that didn't have masks, she could keep her staff. And you start thinking of ways of helping a community that doesn't have to do anything with architecture, anything at all. This memorial is more industrial design, but it's more, I wanna have a word, I wanna say something. So even coming from Mexico, Octavio, look at what's happening now. Kids in public schools, they're studying through televisions. Are you, are you kidding me? In houses, in, in places in Mexico where there's like eight or 10 people in a family that they all need to study, but what, who, who gets the TV or not the TV and with violence in families and in how, so can we provide solutions to put screens on the outside of public spaces and have maybe schools on the outside with maybe uh, teachers that, that uh, help the students uh, uh, with, of course, social distancing, but can we provide solutions for the things that we, are facing right now. And if you don't think that this becomes an, an, an exercise for your brain, you're totally wrong. This is the way your brain should be exercising everything that's happening. You don't have to react to everything, but you have to exercise the idea that if, if you want to react and you want to say something, you can do it and express it the way we did the, the, the memorial. No, So just, just have a word, have a say. And if you have time, just work at it. and 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 put it on the internet and send it to people that you think might react to what you're doing because what will get you hired is the way you think and the way you see life uh, through your eyes and the way you can bring um, the solutions to, to the way you view the world. No? So uh, yeah. hopefully that resonates a little bit. No? Yeah, someone once said to me, turn your pain into beauty. And I think it's a really beautiful sentiment, you know, rather than focusing on the pain, focus on how you can transform this into beauty for others. No, it's a really important one. Uh, yeah. John Cox first said he, he loved the Pasiri house, but then he had also something else to say okay. in the second iteration. He said, I wanted to say that I love the Pasiri house and seeing it under construction. Question, what, first question, what is your favorite project that you have worked on? And two, what would you say as a celebrated architect from Mexico, that the conventional methods of construction that are prevalent in Mexico and Latin America in general have an effect on the built environment and the design and the architecture that originates from that place. Thank you, John Cox, architect. <laughs> uh, thanks, John. Uh, so the first was, what's your favorite project? The, I think that I, I have to say Foroboca has been my favorite project built so far because uh, as I mentioned, it unites it brings together my musical background with, with my architectural career. So I think that was a beautiful uh, project for me to work on and I, and I love that. Um, second, I really, really love Mexican workers. I really admire uh, that if they don't know, I mean, it's funny because yes, we have these big contractors, but I always spend time with a real worker that's there. No, so I, I remember uh, maybe, maybe this is my personal experience, but I, I remember being very frustrated when I came in um, for instance, for a house like the Pasiri house. And I would come in with like 350 drawings to the contractor and he would take all the drawings and then uh, drop it there on the construction site and leave, no? And then, then I would see the guys not even flipping the, the, any of the, uh, of, the, of the pages of the, of the house and just going on site and bending the wires. And so I would spend more time with the workers than with the contractors. So, so I have to say that the way, and I, I was very uh, serious about uh, the words that I said at the beginning, ingenious by necessity. Mexican yeah. workers have this capacity of making sure that they'll find a way to figure out how to do something in a better way, in a cheaper way, in a faster way. So uh, again, uh, if you're this arrogant architect, you, you think you're not gonna learn anything from the guy bending the wires. If you're a receptive architect and you're there and you want this, something done in a certain way and then he comes up with a different solution, well, yeah, you bring in the contract and you have this conversation, but again, they're always willing, if you spend the time and you're there, they're willing uh, to, to, to give you that advice. And they're, they're I mean, again, it's, it's it recognizing the other human being as, this, uh, as equal importance as, as you being there. So um, I think that it, now working in the States and other places, of course, you see some, uh, some people are jealous that we can do certain stuff in Mexico the way we do it. Some people laugh about not having the same constraints as the States or some parts of Europe, but I think we all have different 
different uh, uh, qualities in the different countries. And I think that, again, that becomes a super key thing of having fresh eyes coming into a new community where you figure out the, or do the research of what are the trades. And that when I said uh, digital design, but local fabrication, I don't want to bring all the Mexican workers to all the rest of the world to see how they do things, but I want to see how the local workers can give me that feedback of construction, no? So um, uh, I don't know if I answered uh, your question, uh, John, but, but I think that, uh, again, the construction methods that we have and prevail in Mexico, uh, you're seeing more of them a lot. I, 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 I tend to push a little bit on exploring and experimenting, which to me, Mexico is not only about the, Greek, uh, the gray brick or everything with, with low cost materials, because uh, I mean, to me, it's, it's kind of ironic when you start seeing gray brick and higher residential uh, houses and expect and, 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 and try to think that that's our construction methods. I think that our construction methodology is based on the capacity of our workers and what they can do. And I've seen beautiful crafts. So when, when people question my architecture that it doesn't look too Mexican, I'm like, it's it's a hundred percent Mexican. Look at the workers banging the steel and welding and, and scraping things off. That I I don't know if I can get that same quality in another. Uh, I mean, I could get a factory maybe in Switzerland delivering everything, shifting crates and cranes and everything, assembling to perfection. But but I just love the Mexican way of of how we do things. I liked your octagon machine. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was really true. I was like, oh, I want to see this computer that this guy has. And I want to see how fast they produce it. And the, the guy cutting that, that was he was amazing. He was, I mean, he was just <laughs> like, I, I want to be your friend. I want to learn how to yeah. do that. No? <laughs> <laughs> I've had that also in China where I asked the same question. And then, then you come into the workshop and you see these guys just sitting on it with like hundreds of them. And they're all like, shh, shh, shh doing it and you're like oh okay yeah i guess not but uh it's it's really great thank you michelle i think that's a, a beautiful end to tonight i think it was very healing to have you tonight mm -hmm. and uh i think also the whole thing in the last few minutes i saw some things popping up on my screen seemed to have taken a, a direction for the better so I think we, you know, especially you have put something out in the universe. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Let's hope it sticks. And uh, thank you so much. And see you very, very soon. Uh, hopefully in real at Lensman or in Philadelphia or New York City. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Winka, for thank inviting me. And uh, it's a pleasure being here. And, and hopefully we get to have more of these conversations questioning a role in, in the future of things that are happening, no? Exactly.